Good morning, David and Sally Abel here. As you can see, we are still in our hospital bedroom in Japan. And today is Wednesday, the 11th of March, 2020. Now, purpose of this video, it's pre-recorded because what I'm going to do is explain the symptoms that we received and everything that has happened to improve our state of health, if you like, uh, from the moment it all started to occur on board the Diamond Princess to where we are right now in hospital. We were informed um, to look out for a cough, a fever, and what was the third thing? A cough, a, oh no, a fever. Co cough and a fever. Really Those were the two main things. And if our temperatures exceeded 37.5, to notify the medical centre on the ship. Now, we were anchored in the bay uh, of Yokohama, so we were not permitted dockside at this point, and the ship was in quarantine. But we weren't confined to our cabins. So we could mix with other, cab uh, with other passengers, have meals for the first day. Then the Japanese health authority said, all passengers, they must remain in quarantine and confined to their cabins. So that's what we did. And we were told to monitor our health, to make certain that uh, if any of the symptoms showed themselves, that we notify the medical center. So everybody was issued with a thermometer and this caused a lot of discussion uh, with my videos because I was checking our temperatures under the arm uh, and lots and lots of nurses from all over the world were coming on and saying, that's not correct, you're not getting an accurate reading, test under the tongue. Now. I went on to the internet and looked at the manufacturer of this thermometer and they make three different styles. They all look identical, but there were three different ones calibrated for where you take the temperature. So there was one that was calibrated for under the tongue, another calibrated for under the arm and another calibrated for up the backside. Okay. So you have to know what the calibration of that thermometer is to get an accurate temperature. So ours, on the instructions, which were all in Japanese, but thank God it did have illustrations, it showed under the arm all the way through. So once that was made public knowledge, that check the calibration and where you're supposed to use it, those conversations stopped instantly. But until I had done that, the outcry worldwide from nurses, always under the tongue, always under the tongue. And they were absolutely correct. If they're using a thermometer that's calibrated for under the tongue. Now here, we have our temperature taken four to five times a day by the nurses, and every single one under the arm. Okay, so it depends on the thermometer. That's the first thing. The cough. Now, early in quarantine, we both developed a cough. And we put it down to the air conditioning on the ship because we've done lots of cruises. And I'm not trying to boast, I'm just telling you how it is. We've done lots of cruises and virtually every single cruise, we are coughing because of the air conditioning. This was quite different because now we're confined to the cabin, so we were coughing more, but we still were putting it down to the air conditioning. And with hindsight, it was total denial. You know, we didn't recognize it for what it was. It was the, one of the very first signs of the coronavirus. <clears throat> so Sally's, it was quite a deep cough. Mine was just like a tickle in the throat and it was a <coughs> that sort of cough, and it never changed. Um, so we had, we had the cough without a doubt. Our temperatures, which we were taking 
far more than four times a day. You know, when you're given a thermometer uh, and they say check for three or four times a day, human nature being what it is, we were checking like every hour. It just got into our head, you know, and we were checking very, very regularly. If the temperature goes above 37.5, you call the medical centre. Well, most of the time it was well below, but there was an occasion when mine went to 37.8. And I thought, God, what do I do? Call the medic? And I went into the bathroom, had a wash, shave, came back out, retook it, and it was down 37.4. So I never bothered calling the medical center. Now, that happened two or three times. Didn't go massive up into the 38s, but it was above the 37.5. So again, with hindsight, and hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I perhaps should have called the medical center on the ship. Another symptom is sore throat. Did you have a sore throat? No. Not at all. Neither of us had a sore throat. We didn't feel unwell. We really didn't feel unwell. Um, I did have another symptom, but didn't know it until we were leaving the ship to come to hospital. But, uh, and that symptom was short of breath. Uh, because you're confined to your cabin, so, so I'm not walking anywhere, I'm not doing anything to exert myself, but I did have shortness of breath without any doubt at all. So the way that we understand the virus works, we fully believe that it was a common cold that opened a door to the virus with us. We had no symptoms of a cold, but we were in close proximity to somebody that had a cold. And that sort of opened the door. And I'm not pointing fingers or blaming. I'm just trying to analyze what happened to us. That then opened the door for both of us to receive the coronavirus. Coronavirus comes with many gifts. <laughs> One of them was influenza and the other was uh, pneumonia. pneumonia. Now, the pneumonia is the serious one. That's what's killing a lot of people worldwide. Uh, <clears throat> when we contracted the pneumonia, that's when I really did start to notice a shortage of breath as we were walking off the ship. So, because I'm a diabetic and insulin dependent, we were on sort of a higher priority for the testing of the virus and late one afternoon, two guys or girls came down to the cabin and said, we've come to test you both. And four days later, I think it was about four days, wasn't it? Mm. We were told the result that we were positive. So we had been positive for a number of days up to this stage. And that's when we were at our most contagious. You know, so before the test had been done, We'd, had, we'd got the cough, um, I'd had spikes in the fever, went to bed, both of us one night quite cold, under the duvet, our bodies got warm again quickly, woke up in the morning, there was no fever. But the temperatures did spike, but only just over the 37.5. So we'd got two things, we'd got two, <coughs> two of the things that are important. Uh, one was the cough, the secondly was a spike in temperature. And then for me, it was the shortage of breath, but we didn't know that until we were getting off the ship. So four days later, we got this result to say, yes, you're positive, and we just have to sit it out. So they said, we're going to be taking you to hospital, and it's a six hour journey. And the doctor that came in to explain all this and ran through you know, uh, our body health, as it were, at that time, I think she realized that I wasn't at all well, uh, something that I could not see. She I came didn't. in to assess whether we were yeah. capable of doing that journey. And within 12 hours, the decision was made, no, they're not going to do the six hour journey to hospital. 
it would be a one, one and a half hour journey. And as we left the cabin the following morning, and all I had was my hand luggage, uh, one hand free and pulling the bag, I was really out of breath, just walking down a straight corridor, not uphill, no incline. I was really out of breath. And when we got into the ambulance, and it was a tiny ambulance, very, very small, uh, I could hardly breathe. Now, I'm not exaggerating this. This is exactly how it was. And the mask over my face um, starting to pack me a little bit. I, I needed air, and I felt the mask was stopping the air, and I was lifting the side of the mask to try to get more air into the mouth down to the lungs. Now, when we finally got to the... I'm not exaggerating any of this, am I? I'm really not. When we finally got to the destination, to our first hospital, which is a diagnostic hospital, of course, we didn't know this. Uh, all we knew is we're being taken to hospital. Fabulous hospital. But they specialise in diagnosis. And they get us out of the ambulance, but they weren't quite ready for us in the hospital. So I'm standing there, and I said to Sal, my legs are going, I'm going to pass out. And apparently my colour changed, well you tell it because you saw it. So. Oh yeah, your colour changed, you went very, very pale, parchmenty colour really. And I could see you were going to go. Um, so I called out to somebody to, you needed a wheelchair, you needed somewhere to sit, um, and that you were not feeling at all well, and they sat you back on the step of the ambulance until they got a wheelchair out to you. And you didn't really, you didn't walk anywhere until we got here, you didn't walk anywhere. You were yeah. pushed in a wheelchair everywhere you went because you hadn't yeah. got the strength to, to walk. It was terrible. It was, I'm not gonna say it was frightening. It was terrible. Uh, I felt as if every pore on my body had opened up as I was sitting on the ambulance step. They brought the wheelchair and I could hardly talk. I was so breathless, and I could hardly talk, well. and nice. my emotions got the better of me. Um, yeah, I was very tearful, just couldn't understand what was going on with my body. They spent an entire day diagnosing <laughs> the pair of us. It was... Exhausting. <laughs> it was exhausting. But, you know, we had x-rays, a CT scan, ECG, ECGs, or well, in America, EKG. Uh, um, blood tests. Loads. I've never seen as much blood come out of my body. Armfuls of blood. And they did every test conceivable. And within hours, the doctor brought back a printout. Um, and it was huge. Longer than uh, a normal A4, or what do you call it in America? You don't call it A4 paper. The, the, the long page can't remember what, it doesn't matter, but it was a long printout of what all the blood in our vessels and our organs were doing, complete check of our entire body, and he put a ring round one area, can't remember what it was, it doesn't matter, but it was to do with the respiratory system, and he said, this should be normal at 0.3, Sally's was... I was... 2.3 or 3 point something hers was just a little bit high mine was 5.3 you know really high he said this uh, too high so the word respirator not was, till this hospital oh sorry yeah I'm going a little bit too early so they monitored us for 24 hours and then the doctor came in and he said um Everything that is wrong with you, you've got a common cold, yet there was no sneezing, there was no nose blowing. You've got a common cold, you've got influenza, and you've got pneumonia. acute pneumonia. Acute for me, mild for Sally. So he said, there is no need for any antibiotics because everything you have is viral. And when you have a viral challenge the body heals itself takes care of it itself if it had been bacterial pneumonia they would have been loading us with antibiotics okay but this is viral pneumonia 
So they monitored us really well for 24 hours. The nurses and the doctors were absolutely amazing. They kept us totally informed. Uh, some of them could speak quite good English. Our Japanese is zero, I'm ashamed to say. But some of them could speak good English. Those that couldn't, they had this little gadget around their neck and they, the nurses just spoke into it in Japanese and it came out instantly in English. It was brilliant. So we could communicate very, very well. The doctor the next day came and he said, look, he said, um, I'm going to refer you to a different hospital that specializes in serious diseases. There's infectious another word. Diseases. Serious infections and diseases. <clears throat> so, and they specialize in it. Okay. So I wasn't delighted with that news because I was very happy where we were. I'd gained a great deal of confidence in all of the staff and to consider being moved, I wasn't looking forward to it, but we were. And it was about an hour's journey in the ambulance. Uh, Not even that far, it was less but than But as we hour. left, as we were leaving that first hospital, I'm in the wheelchair and I turn to say to the two nurses that came down, the doctor and the nurses came to say goodbye to us. And I thanked the nurses for taking care of us and I was a little bit emotional and they've got the visors and the masks and all the rest of it so they can't get to their eyes very easily well you tell them Sal you tell well, them they were stood next to me behind him and, and uh, the pair of them had tears rolling down their faces and <laughs> I grieved to they think we're going to die was, I think they you know, probably thought I might yeah. I do because yeah. Sally thought it she thought that I that was going to night. be put into a coffin and brought home in a box she really did and again, not over-exaggerating this, this is how it really was. So we arrived at the next hospital, they had a wheelchair ready, wheeled us in, but they wheeled us into this very strange it room. Emergency room. It was the emergency room. <coughs> All grey walls, very cold in its ambience, if Two you like. Two very, very thin uh, gurney beds yeah there. and we, we were laying down for a couple hours. of hours four hours four we hours. were laying down in er for four hours and every minute of those four hours were being worked on so what i should have said and i've forgotten the doctor who'd been taking care of us lovely man oh he really was yeah, and when lovely. when he was outside the hospital saying goodbye to us he took his cap off you know, that like a shower hat, and his visor, and his apron. And he'd got shoulder length hair. And he'd got shoulder length, jet black hair. Really young guy, it surprised me. Uh, a really young guy, but oh, heart of gold. And uh, <laughs> this is just a step too far. In, in my book, what he did was just amazing. When we got to the second hospital, he arrived there with us in his own car. He followed the ambulance. And when we went into ER, he kept, he gowned up, put all his stuff on, and he talked the doctor through everything that we'd gone through. But they still did it all over again. <laughs> and yet they never took, they never took any of that first hospital's uh, test results. They'd got the whole lot, everything was there. and. They said, no, we want to do our own. So it was all of the blood tests. Anything oh, again, except for the CT. X-rays, <coughs> um, it, it was absolutely amazing. And uh, ECG, EKG, you know, the whole lot. And four hours later, we were put on this ward we're on now, but in a different room where we didn't have natural daylight. There was a window, but it looked onto another building very close. Uh, just a few well, metres away. It. it was a pass. So it was a very, very dark room. Even the nurses said, no sunlight. You know, you need sunshine. Uh, and then, as we were getting better... No, I'm skipping too far ahead, I'm sorry. So the word respirator was used at this hospital uh, in the ER room. We'll probably put you on a respirator. Now, I have worked with hospitals in the UK and because of my job visiting patients who've been really ill, and I've seen lots of people that have been on respirators, 
and I'm not trying to scare anybody because this just scares me and not many of them survived so I thought bugger that I am not going on a respirator uh, even though I need oxygen in my lungs I'm not going to go on a respirator now my oxygen level was 93 and if it had dropped below 90 that's when they were going to stick me on a respirator so I then thought to myself uh, even though I wasn't well you know this is the night after Sally really thought I was going to pass away uh, I thought to myself I have got to do something with my lungs and I started doing lung exercises. Didn't even tell Sally. I just started well, I doing. I said you them. needed to do deep breathing. I didn't know what else you were going to do. But I said you needed to try and get some yeah. oxygen into your lungs. So many, many <coughs> years ago, I used to practice a therapy called EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique. Emotional Freedom. Google it. Emotional Freedom Technique and put in the search Gary Craig, C-R-A-I-G, Gary Craig. He's got a wonderful five minute video that explains how it works. And one of the exercises I used to do with EFT was expand my lungs. So this is what I started to do. And within 48 hours, my oxygen level increased from 93 to 99. Okay, no respirator required. From that moment on, my general health started to improve at quite a rapid rate. Now, every day they keep an eye on us, four lots of tests a day. Um, there's been more blood tests, x-ray and so on. But every day we get uh, blood pressure, temperature, uh, my blood sugar level, um, What's the, uh, the other? And the they listen level. to the oh, oxygen level and they listen all over the lungs, you know, with a stethoscope. And my stethoscope for days, days, I'm not exaggerating, it's probably the best Being part clear. of a week, all clear. They can't hear anything. In the early days, they were hearing crackling. Now there's nothing. It's all clear. All of our test results are really good really i don't want to use the word positive but really really good results i don't want to use positive because this is the nasal test that goes to up the nose down the throat that checks for the virus and you either have a positive or a negative result and i'm getting positive results i've had one negative but at the moment i'm still on positive and i need that to become a series of negatives before we're released out of the hospital so that's the first thing to look out for, a cough, a fever, a throat. Now we didn't have the throat, but we got two of the three and we definitely had the coronavirus because God, I've still got part of I it in me, people, just the remnants of it. I think some people get a headache as well. We didn't get that. Either. Some have had a headache. Yeah, we were asked that question a lot. Have you got a headache? No, we've had no headache. Um, so that's where we are at right now. We're being tested every single day regularly were being given uh, the food that meets our medical needs for our body. Um, not necessarily what we like. It, yeah, it, it's not what we're used to <coughs> in the Western culture, but I've got quite used now to much of the Japanese food. We don't have a knife and fork, we have chopsticks. Um, and that's one of the bonuses of being here. I've got really, really good with chopsticks. So I'm looking forward back home going into a Chinese restaurant and uh, eating with the chopsticks. Quite looking forward to that. So that was a bonus. So with hindsight, yeah, we were in denial without any doubt, or I was. Total denial. Do you know, I am breaking the bed that we are oh, in. David, it's terrible. Now. Bits keep falling. Just take all the stuff there, Sal, and just, just show them what's come off the bed. The bed isn't long enough for an English body. You're moving your I know. This bed is not long enough for an average Englishman. Can you, see, can you see all this? The bottom of the bed. This is the bottom all of the this. bed where my feet rest again. And it's, you can't get it back in. It's broken. And something else just fell off then, you see. But anyway, there we are. Um, so with hindsight, I was in denial, cough, fever, and throat, although I didn't have a throat. If you get those symptoms, 
Don't hesitate. Contact your medical provider and ask for their advice. Simple as that. Don't turn up at your doctor's surgery because they will not welcome you. Yeah, so in the UK, uh, you dial, I think it's 911. No, 111. 111. Uh, they've got a lot of drive-ins now where you, where you drive in, you don't get out of the car, and they'll give you the test literally through the window. And if you test positive, uh, you're told to go back at home. Well, you wouldn't get the result that quickly. You'd be told to go back home, wait. wait for the call. If you're positive, you self-quarantine for 14 days. Now, we have been in hospital three almost weeks. three weeks, one day short of three weeks. So the question that I would be asking the world is, is 14 days quarantine sufficient? I'm still showing positive after three weeks in hospital and, you ha and, you and had we'd it. had it for <coughs> probably six days before we came to hospital okay so is 14 days sufficient um i think that really is about it isn't it well the I, I the odds are we're not contagious <coughs> by the way i've just got remnants of the virus mm -hmm. so you'd probably be very safe to mix with people but i'd never do that I want to be totally, totally clear, 100%, before I mix with anybody. Yeah. Um, I was reading this morning one of uh, the Australians, having done five weeks in quarantine, she's still being told that when she goes home, she'll have to do a further two weeks. Yeah. And, and I think you, that's sensible. Mind you, she does work in the care profession. Yeah. So she would be mixing with vulnerable people, but that means that in the end, she would have done seven weeks quarantine um, from when she first went into hospital. Yeah. So if we were back in the UK and this was happening to us, we would do things a little bit differently. At home, we have an inhaler for when we get a cold um, and it's just a plastic jug and the lid is in the, it goes over your nose and mouth. And into that we pour boiling water. So we've got steam and we put drops a couple of, of drops of, of, what's it called? Ibiza, I think it's called. Well, I can't remember the name, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but we put a couple of drops. Of, it's like camphor. You know, in the olden days, my grandmother used to have a big bowl of steaming water she would put camphor into the water, it floated, and a towel over your head, and you would just take it into your lungs. That is the principle that we have with this. So we would have been using this back in the UK to kill any viruses, anything that's going on in the lungs. I'd have still been doing lung exercises to expand the lung, to get as much, much oxygen in as we could. Um, and we would definitely be dosing up on vitamins. So, well, we've got vitamins, we have got vitamins here yeah. that uh, somebody got for us. I think it was Princess Cruz's got us vitamin C. We've they got did. Three or four packets of but it's vitamin D that I think we really, well, really D, need. Well, D, we need the sunshine. Yeah. That's basically what That we is what we need. Because although it's a sunny day today, yesterday it was pouring with rain the entire day, it's sunny, but it doesn't come into the room. Not uh, till well, it does at about four o'clock and it just hits the far wall. Just before um, the sun goes down. But it doesn't warm the room or radiate the light into the room. But we can uh, see it. We can see it. Which is a lot better. And it's than lovely, a you know, we've got a lovely tree out here and uh, yeah, blue sky today. And Friday, the orange blossom comes out in Japan. Sad that all the events have been cancelled. So uh, visitors will still be able to see the orange blossom. But not orange blossom, but cherry, blossom. cherry blossom. Oh God, my mind! Cherry blossom. They'll be able to see the cherry blossom. Where did we have orange blossom? Florida. Yeah, they'll be able to see the cherry blossom. Uh, but the events in all the parks, every event has been cancelled. So there you go. That is that is our story uh, on what we experienced. I'm not going to say that it's going to be the same experience for everybody all over the world. This is our experience and how the hospital have dealt with it. I think the biggest, biggest issue is if you get pneumonia, it needs to be determined whether it is a viral pneumonia 
or bacterial pneumonia as soon as possible. And it's only the hospital that's going to determine that. And if it's bacterial, you'll be on antibiotics. If it's viral, they, let, they wait and let it work its way out. Now, my latest x-rays have shown I am totally clear of the pneumonia. The virus isn't showing on the x-rays. It's remnants, they say, that are in the nostrils uh, or in the back of the throat. So what I've done today, because I'm having another test this morning, so what I do, can you pass me the chopstick? What I do, you might think this is going over the top, but if I've got remnants of it in my nostril, you chopsticks come in very first. good. So I blow my nose, and I never have anything when I blow my nose, nothing comes down ever, always have a dry nose. And I get a clean tissue, this one I've just used to do this exercise, and now I've got clean end to the chopstick. I dip that in warm water, and that goes up each nostril, change it for another piece of clean tissue to do the other nostril, and that's what I did for the test 48 hours ago, and the bloody thing came back positive, so I'm not convinced it works. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm doing everything I can. If we had salt in the room, I would be gargling with salt, but all I'm doing is gargling with uh, water, which I can't see is going to help well, a great deal. No, the other thing is, I mean, you could sniff the water up so it goes around and comes up through your no, mouth. No, thank you. But I, I no. tried doing that at no. some stage, oh. not this time, and it's horrible. I don't yeah. like it. It's like drowning in a cup. So look, the whole purpose of this, of this video was to show you what our symptoms were, or to tell you what our symptoms were, how we've coped with it, and the experience that we've had uh, whilst enjoying our friend the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been asking me what strain is it? Uh, there are two strains apparently. I don't know and quite honestly I don't really care because I am not going to go up to people in the street walking so towards me and saying got? which strain have you got because I might be infected. You know so I, I am yeah what we now have to do is be more cautious than we've ever been in the whole of our lives. The elderly, of which we are in that bracket, are the most at risk. You know, and and, and very young. And the very young people are also with, at people risk. People with asthma and, and um, so, yeah. other other health. If conditions. you've got underlying health conditions, you know, we're we're in a higher risk bracket. So, our <coughs> not fear, but our major concern is. When we finally leave this hospital and we go out there in the big wide world and the first big place that we're going to be going most likely is the airport. And we're going to be seeing people in masks. There may be some sneezing, some coughing, whatever. There'll certainly be no handshaking from us anywhere. You know, that is totally That's out. Done now. There's going to be a lot of hot hand washing, whether we need to wash them or not. It's going to happen. We've now got that as a regular habit. Um, but the danger for us is if we come into contact with somebody that was to sneeze straight into our face, it's unlikely, but we're not going to wear the masks that anything could come in at the sides. It's a tight fitting mask that we've got for when we leave here. Um, but if somebody did manage to cough or sneeze straight into our face, that's the big danger. We won't be reinfected with this same virus that we've got, but, but we will be open to receive normal. anything else. And we'll else. be open to, to colds, a flu, bit more to more colds and flu. Yeah. But we did both have at home, um, not just before Christmas. We both had a flu. Yeah, good point. A flu shot, yeah. and we both have had in the last two years. We've had a pneumonia shot. Yeah. And I firmly believe that that has made a difference to how we've coped with it. Yeah. Yes, David was very poorly, but it did only last a couple of days. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And as everybody will say to you that's had the coronavirus, you generally feel really good. Yeah. You know, you, you don't realise that you've got it. And the only time now, looking back... Um, reflecting on all of this it's when we left the ship to come to the first hospital 
that was when I was at my worst. Yeah. And I didn't realise it until I until experienced that breathlessness. And, and God, that was frightening. Well, that was frightening. We had three people escorting us down to the ambulance. Yeah. And he had to keep stopping and saying, I can't walk this fast, I can't keep up this pace. I have to and keep that saying, slow really down, I can't keep gasping up. Gasping for breath. It was, I've never experienced anything like that in my life. That's when I realised something's wrong. And, uh, yeah. So there you go. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, if you feel you've contracted this disease, contact your medical provider. By phone. By phone, contact them, explain your symptoms, how you're feeling. And then take all the precautions you can. Regular hand washing. Uh, don't shake people's hands. The antibacterial gel is good, but it's not as good as the hand washing. Um, soap and water is the best yeah, thing you can do. It's the do. best thing of the lot. I know you can't best take thing of the lot. soap and water out with you when you go out, so hand sanitizer yeah. is, a, is an extra. But yeah. soap and water is much, much better than hand sanitizer. And exercise your lungs. If it, pneumonia should happen to get in and it's viral, exercise those lungs, expand them, get as much oxygen in as you can. That was my mega turning point, absolutely. Oh. And it's Gary Craig, Emotional Freedom Technique. Emotional Freedom Technique, Gary Craig, and you'll learn all about it and it's totally free. And it's something you can teach yourself, it's brilliant. I think the other thing is, if you happen to live in a country where it's warmer, get yourself out in the sunshine. Yeah, sit the virus back, can't exist in, in heat. Sit in your backyard and sit in the sun. Find yeah. yourself a spot out of the wind and just enjoy the sunshine because that will help you. It does help get rid of the virus and it makes sort of for your own well-being as well. So don't be scared. You know, a lot of people of our age uh, and maybe younger, maybe slightly older, what we are hearing is that you're scared, you're terrified. Don't let this beat you, all right? We can beat this, providing we deal with it in a timely manner and we really take all those precautions afterwards. Uh, don't be scared. Life must go on. Life is for living. It's not for dying. You know, we live every day. We die once. We don't want to die that once too soon, do we? prematurely so life is following don't let it take control of you you take control of this virus you take control of your body and uh, gary craig emotional freedom technique will help you to do exactly that okay we've said enough that's it get on there with your lives really enjoy it have a great day wherever you are in this world have a wonderful day bye for now